Hello, and welcome back to the Zen Embodiment channel, these bare bones conversations. I'm Corey Hess, and today I have Simon Takur with me. Um, Simon is um, maybe uh, top five people I wanted to have on my, my YouTube channel when I thought about doing this. Um, he's a brilliant guy. He's um, done a lot of homework, you know, and in the embodiment world, I think he's someone who's really done uh, homework, you know, so he's bringing a lot to his work. He, um, he created something called Ancestral Movement, and he has a website and workshops and a Facebook page, which is, you know, kind of one of these pages that you, you go to Facebook for a couple pages, couple groups, and, and Ancestral Movement is, is one of them, you know, so I highly recommend checking those out. Um, welcome, Simon. Hi, Corey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. Um, now, can, can you tell me a little bit about um, kind of your, um, I know you were fascinated with movement. You started out in yoga. And I'm kind of interested in, in what has brought you to where you are with your work. Um, through the practices you've done, it's like, I'm sure they have built upon each other and they've crystallized what you're interested in. So I, I'd love to hear about um, some of your kind of homework I was talking about. Oh yeah, well, um, so, like I grew up in uh, South Island, New Zealand, a town called Dunedin, um, very lucky, wonderful place to grow up because it's like, well, New Zealand's a great country and Dunedin is um, it's very wet and it's full of forest. So, um, and also, you know, compared to the, the, the kids these days, we had a lot of freedom. So I spent my childhood running around in the forest um, and also reading fantasy novels. So, you know, The Hobbit was one of the first books I read as like a six or seven year old and you know, all those, all those books, all about like wizards and magic and um, druids and elves and secret worlds and, you know, a very sort of like mythic kind of animist, you know, the fairy world and whatever, yeah. pagan, very pagan influence, the whole fantasy genre. Yeah. But then um, my dad is from North India, from the state of Bihar in India. And so from like I have a memory of when I was about three or something, I think we were actually on a visit to India to see family. And um, dad just saw me sitting cross-legged on the ground and he was like, oh, you've got really flexible hips. Like, can you do this? And can you put your foot on one thigh? And I did very easily. And he's like, oh, and can you, you put your other foot on your other thigh? And I did very easily in, into like a full lotus position. And then he's like, oh, and try putting your hands like, like this yeah. on your knees and I did and now close your eyes and he's like ha 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 and like chuckled at me and called my mum into the room to look at me and said look at him and I you know I was sitting there like a little yogi um and then from that point on dad was like you know like oh you should do yoga even my dad's never done yoga he's from a very um you know like yeah. he's a strongly atheistic still like raised as a like a quote-unquote Hindu but um you know how it is in modern India, like he doesn't do puja, he doesn't do any of that stuff. But So he's never done a day of yoga in his life, but um, introduced me to the idea. And so then from my earliest years, and both of my parents have like quite academic backgrounds and they're massive book readers. So reading books was something that I was into from the age of literally like six. Um, and so, you know, went to the public library and got all their books on yoga, which was not that many, but, you know, the public library in Dunedin. But so from a very early age, I was looking at books on yoga, seeing pictures of yogis meditating on the sun and the moon and the left and right channel and awakening their, their kundalini shakti. And, and that gels very well with the, the world of the fantasy novels and, you know, Gandalf and Merlin and magical swords coming out of so stones and coming out of lakes and and so on so as a little kid like i was just continually inspired with like i wasn't doing yoga i had no teachers but i was like in that world in my imagination like wow like 
looking deeply into, you know, tree hollows and like wanting to learn the secret mantras or whatever that would unlock the the magic from reality. And then, you know, I had a brief period in my teens where I wanted to be an engineer or, you know, like something that would make money and like, you know, buy a car and like had a very brief period where under the influence of the people around me, I, you know, thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll, you know, not tell anyone that I'm really into this magic stuff and I'll actually just, you know, try and get a job and be successful or whatever. And then um, when I was 18, I did a, uh, an exchange year in my last year of school and went and lived in Thailand in the town called Chukmon in South Thailand. And, um, you know, I'd been doing martial arts since I was a kid, like judo and playing with a bit of boxing, a bit of jiu-jitsu, and I started doing a little bit of capoeira. And then I went and lived in Thailand and the only things in my mind were like, I could do Muay Thai, like Thai, Thai kickboxing, and also learn more about Buddhism because I'd recently been exposed to the, uh, the Tambapad, the, you know, the, the, however you want to pronounce it, but the, um, this classic book of the sayings of the Buddha. Sure. And so then I went to Thailand and, you know, learning about Theravada Buddhism and practicing Muay Thai and speaking Thai and just living the Thai, Southern Thai lifestyle and having a, having a wonderful strange challenging time as an exchange student where they didn't speak English and you know all of those cultural things but the Buddhist stuff for me like right from you know when I first got the Tamapad and you know read those those classic opening lines of like we are what we think all that we are arises from our thoughts with our thoughts we shape the world and just right from that first sentence my hairs are standing on and they still stand on in now when I when I say those words you know because it was like shit like some people really worked some stuff out. You know, I'm sitting there as a 17 year old reading this stuff and going like, you know, it's all of these, you know, the classic young man thing, all of these questions that I've had my whole life, all of this, like, like wanting to understand, like mm -hmm. that it's been explored, you know, that it's not just me. It's like generations of, humans have grappled with this stuff and some people have come up with some really resonant, beautiful, applicable answers. Um, and so I just dived really deep into the, into both the Muay Thai and the Buddhist practice um, while I was in, in Thailand and I became a monk um, in the last like month or six weeks or so that I was there in, um, a little monastery near Chumphon and then went down to a place called Suwa Mok, which you might've heard of. It's one of the, the centers of the revival of the meditation traditions in the Thai forest tradition, started by a guy called uh, Buddha Das uh, Bhikkhu, whose books, whose books transformed my life. Um, again, going from the, the poetic sayings of the Tamapad into the actual nitty gritty of practice based on mindfulness on the in and out breath. Um, so, you know, man, I was, I was living the dream. I was walking around in a robe in a forest full of snakes and monkeys and birds and fighting chickens. And I was going around with my, my bowl, like receiving food from the villagers. And like, for the first time in my life, like people weren't chatting with me about yeah. mundane stuff. And I love chatting about, you know, I love, I, I do love talking to people and doing all these things, but as a monk with my eyebrows, you know, in Thailand, they even shave your eyebrows. So you look like an alien. Yeah, yeah. So now you're not, a, you're not a person anymore. Now you're a monk and the archetype of the monk in Thailand is still this super, super respected thing. And then they're like, you're a foreign monk and you're a young man. And so you must be like on the path to enlightenment sort of stuff. And I was like, well, well, yes, I really want to be. And I feel like I am. And like, yeah. cool. Now people aren't chatting to me and asking me to, you know, entertain them in all these ways. And I can actually just practice. And I had this like beautiful period of um, really intensive practice. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of a roundabout way of like leading into how 
as a young person, like I was into this stuff from a very early age. And then once I spent that time in the monastery, yes. my ideas of like studying engineering and having a successful sort of mainstream life with a car and a job and those sorts of things that just went right out the window. I was like, this is, this is the bomb. Like I want to meditate. Um, and so then on my return to Australia after that period, obviously it was a huge upheaval and being like, okay, now I'm at university. Um, you know, like people are, you know, I didn't want to do the performance of like, I have just come from the monastery. Let me tell you about it. But like my friends knew mm -hmm. and, um, you know, before I'd gone to Thailand, we'd all been sort of running around taking LSD and, um, you know, we're all into martial arts and like Eastern stuff. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful time. And then I came back from Thailand and I'd been doing all my Muay Thai and meditating in a monastery and, and I was still the same old guy, you know, it's like, yeah, but I'm still just like, right. whatever, like I've just gone deeper into that stuff that I was already really into and you all knew I was into it. So, um, but so then at university, I went through this transition of like, I had been still studying stuff for like physics and maths and right. um, chemistry, you know, engineering stuff and also some Asian studies. But then I started to like, I transitioned from that into what I discovered, you know, you go to university and you don't even know yet what you can do. They don't even tell you like what's available. Yeah. And then I discovered this field, like I started studying anthropology and I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. I because I kind of considered myself an anthropologist from my time in Thailand and my time in India and whatever. Yeah. And then I discovered biological anthropology, the mixture of evolutionary biology, like paleoarchaeology and anthropology. And I was just like, this is the stuff. Like yeah. I that's because you know, I didn't mention this, but in my time growing up in New Zealand, running around in the forest, right from the, the longest I can remember, I was always like, but how did we get here? Like, what's, you know, and I'd be like, mum, dad, like, where did, where did we come from? Like, where did, like, how did humans get here? Like, um, and trying to understand, like, so there was just always this big gap. It's like, oh yeah, cavemen, something, something, apes, something, something, evolution, cavemen, and here we are. And it's just like, but like, you know, how did, where did these cities come from? Where did, language come from where did all these things come from and and as a 16 15 14 13 year old i was already like i don't know anyone who can make fire yeah, yeah. like you know all this sort of stuff like i don't know anyone who can do anything yeah like yeah. we all seem kind of useless so then right this this fascination with um with understanding humans as primates Right. was something that I was really into from a very young age of going like, oh, we can explain so much of human behavior by just thinking of humans as a bunch of apes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, quite intelligent, yes. but not obviously not intelligent enough to grapple with like exploding populations and fossil fuels and computers and space rockets. And like, we can invent this stuff, right. but we can't like work it all out. We're just running around like, you know, more complex equivalent of bashing rocks together right right so um yeah so anyway yeah well so, can, uh, I just say, can i just say it sounds like you know you were driven further into your process you know you went to thailand and you you went deep but it seems like there was this driving force for you to keep diving further into maybe some kind of wholesale experience this so what's okay? I've experienced this, but I need to go further. I need to go deeper. I need to um, go beyond maybe what culture, you know, what's what's real, what's before that, what's the primordial, exactly. Aspect, right? Exactly. So that was the that was the when I so once I came back to university and started studying the biological anthropology, and at the same time I encountered my first Chinese martial arts teacher, who's also a Chinese medicine practitioner. This little guy from Shanghai called Fei Wang, who lives in Canberra. Um, so we were doing Qigong and internal martial arts and I was learning Japanese Jiu Jitsu and still meditating and studying biological anthropology and trying to understand from the evolutionary perspective, how 
a primate comes to assume the full lotus position and direct its attention to its breath and feel its breath responding to its mind, responding to its breath, and somehow start to unravel the knots of emotion and character and personality and, and you know, yeah. perceive subtler and subtler layers of reality and just going like, where the hell does this come from, from an evolutionary perspective? Right. And I started to develop these ideas of like, well, it kind of seems like a lot of this stuff, which we refer to as advanced yoga practice, it kind of feels like that stuff is actually innate. It, it, is, it has to be innate in the species if we're doing it at all. But then from an evolutionary perspective, it seems like actually before urbanization, before agriculture, you know, through the ice ages, it seems like a lot of what we think of as, as advanced yoga was just fundamental survival skills for thousands of generations of humans and pre-humans living in the wild and, and, and then going, oh, and those practices in those traditions are tangled up and wrapped up with, from, from what we can see of existing traditions today, yeah. wrapped up with nature worship and like, like looking into like this, this animus, animist worldview where you see all of the little creatures as, as family, the four-legged people, the six-legged people, the no-legged people, the winged people, um, and, you know, like trees having consciousness, valleys having consciousness, mountains having consciousness, um, and all these sorts of things. And so this, all of this was jumbling around in my mind of like this ancient, and for me, like even just the image of the pre-agricultural, pre-urban earth, with human beings on it. It's just this, you know, this this world covered in forests, you know, like just so, so beautiful. The stars flooding the sky every night. And like, so, from, so that picture just has always just filled me with like awe and wonder and also a terrible grief, yeah. you know, like this tragic, like we've just woken up and he, here we are at this stage of the story. We don't know what's been lost. So much has clearly been forgotten. Whole languages, whole cultures wiped out in war and famine and disease and climate change and all this stuff. And it's like, here we are. But this sense of the, the awesome past and the, the awesomeness of our ancestors yeah. being yeah. like has been this constant source of inspiration for me and this feeling like okay the yoga that we've got now feels like it's a little a, sh a shell like some remnants of the ancient yoga yeah. and the buddhist practice is like the buddhist the buddhist the, the the revelation of the buddha was like he was like this is a rediscovery right yeah. it's like this is this is the the stuff right. and already in his time you know yoga was all going on and there was all sorts of amazing stuff going on but just this idea that it's like in different cultures and different places and different times, this stuff which is innate in us, right. it's always like bursting in, bursting to get out, right. but we're too busy right. or too, you know, whatever. Right. So looking into different cultures of how it's expressed and so on has been then the, the ongoing drive linked with my scientific training to try and understand and better explain my own experiences, you know? Yes. I love it. Um, you know, like for me in my own my own history, I, I was a Rinzai Zen monk in Japan. And, you know, I'm there and I'm doing this really difficult practice and there's all this form. And, um, and in that form, you discover, like for me, what I felt like I discovered was something, you know, very pre all of that, very, um, you know, you, you start to, your spine starts to wake up as I think you you talk about sometimes, and this is not you know Japanese. This is not you know uh, Australian American. You know, um, so you know I, it, that we can sort of use the body as a tool to kind of mine back and discover these kind of universal truths through the body. I think it's part of what I really was interested in your work is you know you seem to be what I really love is using the body as this tool to go back and discover these universal 
real truths that aren't bound by, you know, any kind of culture. Just awesome, you know. Please. Yeah, sure. Okay, so that was um, probably while I was living in Japan. Actually, um, I, um, you know, in my in my in my early twenties, I, I left university um, to go and live in Japan for a bit, um, and you know, live out some of my fantasies of learning to be a, a samurai and a ninja and a yeah yeah um, you know Zen Shinto warrior you know adventurer. Um, I don't know if you know the movie Ninja Scroll, but that was a uh, yeah that was that was a that was a big one. <laughs> For me, um, I was really into the samurai stuff from, from when I was a little kid. So I was living in Japan and I called during this time my own personal philosophy. I called it apism, yeah, which was uh, to, to understand all human behavior using the uh, simple maxim that we're just a bunch of apes um, going to war with each other and so on. And so I was learning, I was practicing capoeira as well yeah. and doing lots of tai chi and Chinese martial arts and Japanese martial arts. And I found the cup where, particularly the cup where Angola, yeah. the older sort of more strongly African influenced style of cup where I found that to be, I considered it almost to be an antidote to all of the upright postural work, which I was getting from the yogic, the Buddhist meditation traditions, the Chinese traditions, the Japanese traditions, which were all very, like the Chinese traditions have a lot of like animal stuff and wave movement and learning to use the spine and the whole body in very beautiful naturalistic ways, strongly influenced by Taoism, but still all of them very much influenced, emphasizing this upright spine, wonderful, wonderful practice, but to then be doing capoeira and be moving around and going upside down and spinning and linking that with the rolling practices from the jiu-jitsu and the Aiki jiu-jitsu, I, I had my own little separate practice, which I called my monkey body training, yeah. which was combining the, the rolls and cartwheels and the movement on all fours from capoeira with some of the wave movement from the Chinese arts and, and so on. And I really loved my monkey body training. But then at one point during this time, maybe it was when I was in China, maybe it was when I was in Japan. I can't remember at which point it happened exactly. But um, the spinal wave, the spinal wave stuff, like which had which had I'd been interested in right from the start, but then it started almost having a life of its own. Yeah. Like it got to a certain point where the wave just became addictive and like you know enthralling. Like like wow, like what is this? And waves of like bliss and waves of pleasure, and also this like frustration of feeling oh there's points which aren't getting it, and then wanting to get them, making them get it, making them get it, bringing it up. Meanwhile, learning about practices like the microcosmic orbit from the Taoist traditions and so on and going, oh, and of course the Kundalini stuff, you know, the famous yeah. Kundalini snake serpent power rising from the base of the spine and going, oh, okay, so there's my monkey body practice. But then there's this central axis snake stuff, yeah. which I don't, you know, there's language for it in some different traditions, but it's like, again, from the evolutionary perspective, like what the hell, like what, what is this? And then um, at some point during this time, I had an experience where I discovered this tube from my mouth yeah. through my digestive tract to my anus. And this, this tube, like, I think this, 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 like, experience that really, like, hit me was when I was, like, I was making love to my partner at the time. And I discovered that, like, this feeling of, like, this thing from my mouth to my anus and my and my penis, my genitals, that it it was a separate being. That I was this Simon sort of like little homunculus in the in the you know in the cockpit or something. And the body was just like crazy animal vehicle, but then there was this separate separate digestive tube one which was blind, operating purely on sense and wanted to devour and reproduce, like devour and excrete and and fuck. And it didn't care about me. It didn't care about this Simon right. dude at all. That is just and it was this like this feeling of this blind 
worm at the center of my being and like going like whoa that's that's pretty weird yeah you know like that's and the 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 weird part was the feeling of of it being distinct a distinct layer of me and completely separate from my human ideas of me and so then you know during this period i was like okay so the apism is not a complete enough philosophy you know there's more to it it's like okay i'm an ape but what about this worm layer of myself and then i was like oh then i started to go oh shit like what about a layered picture of what a human is and going like right there's a worm layer and looking into the digestive cube and starting to do comparative anatomy and go of course yeah all creatures which have evolved from worms have retained maybe not all some of them have gone on some some side some sidetracked into some other patterns but most of us have retained our worm layer and then going on there's a fish layer and oh there's a a four-limbed tetrapod reptilian layer and then a mammalian layer and go on and so once that like really this took years of thinking about this stuff and going why you know wondering to myself why do all creatures seem to have heads you know and these sorts of little things which were just which would just fascinate me i'd be meditating and it'll be like why do we all have heads why do ants have heads and humans have heads and so on right and so then over time over a few years in one certain period, probably about 10 years ago, all of these like ideas just went doosh, 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 doosh. And I was like, ah, ancestral movements are embedded in the anatomy, embedded in the nervous system. And they're continually, they're continually there. And it's like this, this sort of pyramid structure or this, this layered structure. And then literally, the the human awareness is like this very very thin tiny little tiny little bit riding here and i'm doing it up here because it's like you know the the evolution of the prefrontal cortex is like this little this little layer on the top whose main job is to inhibit inhibit and regulate all of that other stuff to stop it from emerging and going oh okay and that's when i i thought about it and i was like okay ancestral movement that's what i will start to now call my lens on on all this stuff and like you say right this it's like okay this is okay you can use this to understand human movement patterns and so on but for me yes it's really interesting in understanding movement patterns and playing with movement and looking at movements that we have from different layers of our evolutionary evolutionary history and so on but the link with the meditation traditions is this is this each layer of getting into the like the like we probably i don't want to go right into it but you know about the dependent origination right this idea that like yeah. the way that the way the mind works is certain things stimulate certain other things and then you respond in a certain way and then it's like this 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 process of cause and effect and how stimulus leads to different sorts of responses yeah and and understanding oh there's different layers of that and so there's a whole bunch of my system which is that of a primate which notices berries like if i scan through the forest i don't i'm not looking for berries but my eyes naturally pick out the berries just as i scan through in the same way that my eyes scan for movement because of my you know my history and going like oh okay every aspect of myself is because of certain layers and you know chewing and swallowing certain things which are just automatic and this process of observing the body and then of observing the mind and observe and of acknowledging the things i have in common with all of my primate family the things i have in common with all of my mammalian family the things i have in common with all of my family that are still fish the things i have in common with all of the other worm creatures and then deeper and deeper and deeper into the body as a pulsing bag of liquid right. of tubes of liquid pumping around which i have in common with my plant cousins you know what i mean and then and then the thing of like being breathing breathing cells made of essentially salt water yeah and so this practice it's like it's like just at each layer discovering more and more and more and more deeply and feeling more and more and more deeply the reality of 
being part of the living family on the earth yeah. and that at its basis the body is not separate from the earth the, you know the borders of the body are open and continuous and the body is just part of the flow of nature which is the classic buddhist and Taoist yeah. and animist and every worldview you know so it's like linking the embodied practices with uh obviously i'm a i'm a, I'm a total nerd right so it's like this left brain wanting to understand but also having done all these practices and the left brain's going i want to understand what's happening to me you know what i mean it's not a like i just want to understand intellectually it's like wow this stuff's happening to me and it's fascinating and it's beautiful and i want to be able to talk about it with other people yes. because otherwise i'm just this loner feeling really isolated and really weird so yeah well i think that's i mean you know one thing i i think about with your work is is you can articulate it and people can't really articulate this stuff that they just can't you know often it becomes very it becomes esoteric immediately or it becomes yeah. you know goes into um you know jargon that only a few people can talk about um but it also seems so big in a yeah. certain way it's like um you know how can we you know our whole practice our practice can be big then i feel like in a way what i, I like about what what i've experienced or seen of yours is it you know they're all you're interested in so many things and they all kind of are are looked at through this kind of lens of the ancestral movement so doing your bagua bagua or bjj or um you're studying about shamanism or it all seems to kind of you figured out a way to make it all work through your ancestral movement lens. I think that's really interesting. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, um, yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, I realized with, at some point that that was kind of one of the roles that was open to me in that, like, you know, I'd gone off to live in Asia and, you know, spent probably 10 years living in different parts of Asia, studying these traditions, learning, you know, learning to speak Japanese and Thai and Mandarin and spending years at a time in these places doing this stuff. Because I figured, well, I've got the passion and I have the opportunity. And I have very few obligations and I was very much on my solo sort of hero's journey kind of kind of style stage and I was like well I, I should do it I'm I'm the one with the opportunity and the passion and I should do it but then once I discovered um and you know so once I started really studying the comparative anatomy and then the neuroscience and once I clicked on some of these ways of explaining things which I was like hey does this make sense to anyone else yeah, right. because this, this actually has started to make sense to me right. with the you know, we haven't we haven't talked about it about it yet um, here, but you know, you and I have mentioned it in the past with some of the the neuroscience and the body maps and the neuroplasticity and the yes. the interoception and all of these. There's this whole world of like the contemplative neuroscience, which has arisen in the last couple of decades. Yes. Um, but then linking that with the evolutionary biology and just being like, well, look, I can verbalize some of this stuff in a way that seems to make sense and and go, okay, well realizing that i'm kind of a bridge right between between different cultures you know yeah. it's like chinese medicine like i'm a massive i'm an extremely skeptical person um i believe critical thinking is like one of the most important and underrated skills um that there is and at the same time i practice ancient deep embodiment right methods which are described and and so on in sanskrit and classical chinese you know and i don't speak sanskrit or classical chinese i speak mandarin and some hindi and i try to study some sanskrit and classical chinese but like you know there's this huge huge area of of communication and so i can talk to some full-on skeptical rational materialists who are anti-chinese medicine and i can say yeah i also think there's a lot of superstition and blind faith in Chinese medicine, but what if we describe these, these, what if we describe qi in this different way, you know, not as energy, but what if we just describe it as the, the perception of, of physiological change, right. you know, like, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and go like, there's all these ways which we can, we can, um, 
use use our language differently to be able to communicate with different groups of people. And I realize that that's one of my that's one of my jobs, you know, it's one of my, yeah. my gifts, if you like, to pick up other languages and then, and then learn to communicate with people. Um, you, you know, and, and also Simon, it, you know, <clears throat> so much of spirituality and whatnot, it, it, of course it becomes disembodied, but also it becomes so it often it's very narrow and specializes. It feels like, um, well, I've got to give this up if I'm going to do this, you know, or whatever, or, you know, for me, you know, shave my head for, you know, whatever to, to really d dive into this. And I think what, again, it's like, you know, like you said, this bridge, this idea that you can, um, you know, be, be doing, learning to make a fire and doing uh, movement practices and this and that and they're all a part of this practice of uh i think that's really interesting and, and helpful for people to to think about you know you know what i'm saying totally man and so that's you know it's like on the one hand so for a while i was i was teaching yoga right before i started before i came out with ancestral movement and told people here's the shit i'm really into yeah I was teaching yoga, I was teaching Chinese medicine. Well, I wasn't teaching Chinese medicine. I was teaching some Qigong, some Chinese yeah. internal practices. I was studying physical therapy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, working as a body worker. And so I had this, like, I was using the neuroscience and the, the so on to, to describe yoga in a way which was really effective and really, you know, really, really valuable to do the meditation stuff. But then when I came out with the ancestral movement, thing that has allowed me to use all of these different practices to fulfill like I have an agenda now you know it's like and my agenda is like to try to share yeah. with other yeah. people the most meaningful stuff in my life which is just removing some of the some of the layers of muck yeah. from our eyes yeah. the layers of cultural conditioning which stop us from just being here and paying attention yeah you know yeah. like you've got this thing of like secular buddhism and secular mindfulness and so on and it's it's great stuff i'm a fan but it's like like my agenda is is love for the earth like 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 childlike awe and wonder and then turning into grown-up mature yeah. like just sexual eyes wide open body fully fully feeling like grown-up reverence for like this place is beautiful look at this world Right. look at this body and feeling and this is where it comes into like my understanding of like the importance of ancestor worship yeah and animism yeah it's right. like yeah like ancestor worship it's not it doesn't have to be this strange idea of like a superstitious oh the ancestors are watching and we must keep them happy and not make them angry yeah but instead should be this thing of like well you know the maxim in biology that nothing in biology makes sense outside of the context of evolution Right. Same as dependent origination. Everything happening in this moment is entirely 100% dependent in every way on everything that's happened right up until this moment. Right. And so then the ancestor worship becomes this thing of like experiencing the self, yep. the body, the entire world with this ancestral lens where you see and feel the eternal past always leading into this moment mm -hmm. and you feel like thousands of generations of humans and pre-humans and pre-pre-humans and all the way back to the ancient ocean and all the way back to the original source of all things if such a thing ever existed right all right. emerging out and then here we are and all of our families that you know some of us became trees some of us became worms some of us became eagles some of us became jellyfish and whoa, here we are, most of us are still bacteria. 
and you feel it all and it's like we're part of the family and it's incredible and it's beautiful and it's ecological it's all working together and this you know this sense of the shifting balance of nature and so on and so on and so on and so that's become my agenda where it's like yes we can practice ancestral skills like learning to make a fire we can practice traditional dance from all over the world we can practice the deep embodiment yogic methods of paying attention and so on we can practice like animal tracking or anything, anything, anything. Literally, we can even practice like modern break dancing or whatever. Once we can, if we can shift our awareness and start to see everything we do as being based on, you know, experiencing the past, yeah. the eternal yeah. past in every moment of the present, like that's sort of this shift, the shift in perception, which is the main, you know, at my workshops, I say, we're gonna practice a bunch of movements and things, but my main agenda is to ideally permanently change your perception of the body and the world through yeah. this work. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I completely understand. I love it. Um, so that was my, that was my next question. So, um, you know, I, I, I got a lot of Buddhist people looking at this, this helps society. Um, this helps save all beings because uh, they can you just say that again you know uh, real quick you know that this practice will will help save all beings because we will feel through our bodies cellularly that we're connected to everything right yeah and i but i do think because you know in the in a lot of buddhist practice and a lot of yoga practice and i held this idea for for many years there's this idea of like just direct experience is everything yeah and i do believe that that's true once direct experience gets taken to like a really seriously high level of practice yeah which which most of us will not attain right so i really believe that the 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 parallel streams of direct experience and contemplation. Mm -hmm. Like you can't say, oh, I just practiced direct experience. And then it's like, well, what? Have you switched your brain off for yeah. the rest of the entirety of the day? No, you're thinking about stuff. Sure. And so what are you thinking about? Because you're shaping the world with what you think about. You're shaping where you direct your attention. You sure. know, where we direct our attention is culturally conditioned. Yeah. What topics you think about is culturally conditioned. Yeah. And so choosing to contemplate certain things and so this is again my agenda with ancestral movement is going well what if we link these classic embodiment practices yeah. and and link them with contemplations on evolution and biology and ancient history and all of these incredible mysteries yeah. which in many of us you know this was a wonderful discovery for me to realize i'm totally not alone in this at all but which in many of us conjure up amazing feelings of awe and, and beauty and humility and desire to serve and desire to act and, you know, and gratitude and so on and so on, which, cause you know, reverence for nature is built into us. Right. 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 And the nature deficit syndrome, which so many of us are suffering in the modern world, it's a powerful thing. Right. And so linking these nature connection, practices like ancestral ancestral skills and whatever but also just contemplation you know like we can do a practice of sitting and observing our body and we can contemplate the body as a, a living breathing bag of liquid or we can contemplate the body as a an ecosystem a vast landscape with a thriving community of organisms all living out their lives on our skin and behind our teeth and Right. You know, all of these things, um, which are very much a part of the Bhutto practice, which I know that you've looked into as well, right? This like link of the, the human imagination being this divine, yeah. limitless, like incredible gift. And so going, well, we can do our practice. We can do our direct experience practice. But what if we link it with a trained imagination where we're really like, whoa, exploding our imagination and noticing, because this is the thing, if you just practice imagination, it's cool. But if you practice deep embodiment 
yeah. and you can feel your physiology responding to your imagination, then things get really, really, really interesting. Yeah. And so that's part of, you know, and so I'm like, well, you can imagine whatever you want and you can go for it. But for me, it's like imagining ecological connections and switching on my, my inner eye as being like able to perceive the microscopic realm of all of the little bugs and worms crawling all over everything, eating each other and shifting like my imagination to experience this moment with a time lapse of like a hundred thousand years or a million years or a billion years of earth evolving up until this moment. And here I am sitting yeah. these sorts of things, you know, yeah. Yeah. It, like, it can be overdone. The contemplative imaginative aspect, I think can be overdone. The direct experience and direct observation is, I still believe the fundamental practice, but I really believe in this linking of the two. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, I'm thinking about my my favorite Kazuo Ono and um, him basically um, belie believing that all of his movement, and this is mostly people he's thinking about, but just basically that our 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 whole body is is our ancestors um, expressing themselves through us, through his dances, his ancestors. And I think, you know, for you, yeah. it's like, take it a step further. It's is this is you know the 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 primary forces of the universe expressing through us. I, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. Love it. Um what can you tell me um what's what would be like a an ideal kind of I mean of course there'd be several but a, a workshop that you would just your dream workshop that you would you would be hosting. What would that be like? Well might one of the um, sorry, what was that? Might be what you're doing. Well, yeah, I was just, I was just gonna say. So, we um the past six or seven years, we've been maybe it's seven, eight years now. I'm not sure. We've been running these uh these retreats um in the forest down on the south coast of New South Wales. Which um at first they were just like a little movement camp, and we'd do movement stuff and meditation stuff, and then. We started getting in guest teachers every time and we got in um, in one of the early ones, we got in my my good friend and mentor, uh, Jake Kassar, who's a like survival skills and bush tucker, um, you know, self-taught genius from the Central Coast, New South Wales. We got him in to teach us bush tucker and survival skills. And, and then I started, you know, openly teaching more of the, the ancestral movement principles and ideas and weaving in these ecological meditations with our Qigong practice and um, you know so it became this uh, over several years it, it really became this unique mix of like we're in this beautiful beautiful forest by, by a, a small river with fish and eels and there's the goannas the big monitor lizards that live there and wallabies and wombats and you know snakes and all these beautiful creatures and wonderful forests wonderful rocks and and we'll practice you know we don't have a schedule we turn off the clocks we don't have any electricity we're all just camping in this wonderful silent natural beautiful place and you know so we practice deep movement practices, deep meditation practices, qigong practices where we're sending our mind out into the world and washing it through the body and, you know, washing the beauty of nature through the landscape of our body and all of these practices which really come alive in a natural place like that. And we'll do contemplations on on rock and looking at looking at like anchored in a rock and thinking about where that rock's come from and trying to grapple with geological time and then looking at our bodies and thinking of all the particles of our body, which are come from pulverized yeah. rock, that, you know, washed around in the oceans and under the, you know, the, the magma of the earth and spewed out and then it's in our bodies. And then millions of years in the future, it might be congealed back into rock again. And then we'll do the same kinds of contemplation for water and breath and, you know, weaving in these things. But then in the afternoon, we'll be weaving baskets or learning to make fire with sticks or tanning hides or, whatever and we've built this huge jungle gym so we'll be playing on the jungle gym like monkeys and throwing and catching balls and dodging sticks and yeah. you know getting in guest teachers to t teach us about Feldenkrais or 
yeah. you know, contact improvisation or whatever, like wrestling and BJJ and, you know, so it's a, it's like a, this is, so it's like, yeah, we've, we've created yeah. uh, a dream of like, we're linking in movement practice and we're constantly learning and we're getting in new guest teachers and we have a, an indigenous elder from nearby who comes and tells us stories and so on about the, the region. And it's like this, it's not a dream workshop because yeah. it's, it's ongoing. It's like this constant yeah. development of relationship to this particular place and relationship to the earth and relationship to our bodies. And we're learning to fix our anatomy and exploring the animal movement patterns and, and so on. So it's like, um, I think still to this date, it's my, it's my favorite event. It's very low key. It's yeah. not like a, yeah super cathartic destroy you with movement practice and epic like meditation because that would require a little bit more control of the day so it's a bit more free flowing a bit more lazy yeah. um a bit less uh hardcore but um yeah that weaving together of what we call primitive skills or ancestral skills of animal tracking and you know, making fire and building shelter and finding food and, you know, digging for tubers and weaving that together with meditation and body practices in the nature ongoing over time with the indigenous link. It's like, it's not perfect, you know, it's like, but it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a beautiful mixture of activities. Yeah. 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 Love it. Love it. It just sounds, you know, it sounds like you kind of figured out how to bring the, all these things together. It's just really cool. Um, a lot of us, you know, former monastics, we talk about some kind of Bhutto Zen camp, you know, and, um, and but I, I just, I mean, it's inspiring. I love hearing what you're saying. I, um, yeah, I, I do a workshop with you, man. I'd, I'd love it. That's right oh, up my alley. What's that? We get you as a guest teacher. We get different guest teachers for these retreats every every time, and it's like that's part of the the joy. Is like I yes. at every at every camp, I am a student. You know, like last time we had my friend um, Jules Singawa, she was there sharing like African like African drumming stuff that she's learned from her African teachers and so on. And it's just like yes, so resonant. You know, it's like one retreat it'll be African drumming, another retreat it'll be survival skills and animal tracking and and because there's enough people who come to almost every camp, yeah. I don't have time to learn all this stuff from every single guest teacher, but yeah. maybe one or two people will take enough so that whatever we get from each guest teacher stays in the field, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. So, yeah, man, you're, you've got a standing invite to come. That'd be awesome. Oh, I love it. Uh, well, um, really thank you so much for coming and and um spending a little time with me i think my my listeners will really um find what you said interesting and and again like so well rounded in a way i think um uh just thinking about you know life as a whole and how to um bring their practice maybe into life in a in a more integrated way I think uh, a lot of people are searching for that. So I think that's really interesting about our, our chat today. Mm. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I hope it's um, I hope it's helpful. It's funny with like these big topics, it's always sort of, I'll just go like blah, 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 and then I'm not sure what I've said. No, no. But like, yeah, hopefully, you know, I'm always like, I'm always hopeful that with the people I work with, like I work with this big mix of people, I'm always hopeful that like, the dancers and the meditators will maybe think about taking up a little bit of strength training and maybe investigating wrestling. Maybe like, do a bit of wrestling. Like, and then like the people who are wrestlers or athletes or like, therapists, like physios or whatever, maybe they'll go like, oh, I should start to explore a bit more dance or ancestral skills or, yeah. you know, so trying to bring these different subcultures yes. and like help, help people. Because I find like it's like meditation – it's wonderful and it's awesome, but it's like maybe you need a bit more like tree climbing and wrestling. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, ooh, and, ooh. and so on, like a bit more of the, a lot of people need a bit more grunty. A lot of spiritual people need a bit more grunty, sweaty training. Yeah. And a lot of grunty, sweaty people are looking for some meditation practice, which is 
yes still accessible and not like oh i have to become a buddhist and shave my head like yeah you know so hopefully hopefully yeah. i can get at least a little bit of that across yeah, yeah. I, I i yeah totally i mean i always think about that like um you're so soft from your um your tai chi but you couldn't throw a spear you know what i mean like right you know i can't i can't yeah. throw a spear because i'm, I'm yeah. too soft throwing, throwing throwing and running man it's like ah. Uh, I, know. I still feel like uh, I feel like my development like got stunted at the age of about 10 you know where like mainstream society wasn't wasn't pulling me towards like continuing to develop my throwing and my running I was like no nah, I don't want to hang out with those people I want to read my books and do my weird esoteric shit I, um I, so yeah yeah I mean that's another whole conversation of like going like creating creating subcultures which allow us to actually right. continue our, our development as it should have progressed as children you know like because right. right. we're, we're supposed to develop into well-rounded human beings who can track all the animals who know all the plants who right. can listen and calm down their nervous system or activate it when we need to you know what i mean it's like and look after each other and sense it read each other's non-verbal signals and you know we're supposed to be these supreme communicators who are fully attuned with nature yes. but culturally yeah. we've been taught to pay attention to yes all these other all these other things which are you know maybe um maybe pulling us away from being in love with the earth right. obviously yeah right yeah totally 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 um yeah beautiful beautiful um really informative please everyone please check out Simon's um, website, which I think is, are you like redoing it right now? Yeah, yeah, I am. And um, my uh, my web developer actually um, has just had a bout of uh, COVID. Oh no! Yeah, she's been out of action for for months, and my website's currently on on hold. Um, I was should be at should be yeah, it should be oh, back up and. Like yeah. Back up and good to be like um, in in January, yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, but people can join the Facebook group and you know find me on Facebook and you know you can find my email and get in touch and that'd be cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah. So so anyway, thank you so much, Simon. Thanks for taking the time um, away from your family and uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Nice to nice to see you. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, more, more again sometime, maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.